Okay, and since we're filming, I have to go through the official welcome to the Ground Zero uh, SSIS class for people who want to learn to do SSIS good and want to learn to do other things good too. Uh, who can tell me where I got that title from? Zula, who said that? You get a prize. There you go, it's that easy, here you go. <laughs> okay, so um, what this class is and what this class isn't. Um, first off, uh, a few more people showed up than I thought would, and I've never really been very good at picturing things, so I'm just going to have to ask you all to go ahead and get in your underwear right now. <laughs> um, okay, so I've been to a lot of SIS classes in my day, um, a lot. And one of the things that I find that they don't do is they don't teach you practical SIS knowledge that will get you all the way through. What they do is they teach you, here's how this feature works, here's how that feature works, here's how that feature works. Then at the end, they have a, a real short section on, uh, on, on tuning, right, on, on how to improve the performance of your packages, and then you go on about your way. But nobody teaches you how to architect pack packages. They don't teach you how to... Um, how to think in SIS, right? How to build something from ground zero so that it's supported well, maintained well, debugged well, and so on and so on, right? So we're going to take a little bit different tact with this class. We're not going to burn through the tasks like they're going out of style. We're going to spend a little bit more time with each task and we're going to learn each task and learn some really good things, some really good ways that we can put these things together from ground zero and we're just gonna we're just gonna build on that knowledge okay so even from from this class here you're not gonna know, you're not gonna learn six different tasks tonight you're probably gonna learn two or three right but you're gonna learn those a lot better and you're gonna be able to actually use those in real production environments and I'm gonna show you the kind of stuff I'm talking about um, so this is the point in the class when most instructors say okay and they, they, they give you the, the PowerShell slide and they say, okay, here's what ETL is and here's where SIS fits into the Microsoft product family and all of that. I'm assuming that since you guys showed up early and wanting to know SIS, that you already know what SIS does, right? Um, I'm also going to assume that you already know what ETL is. If anybody doesn't know what ETL is, raise your hand and I'll be happy to tell everybody what ETL is. If you're embarrassed to raise your hand, then feel free to come up to me afterwards and I'll sit with you for an hour and explain to you everything about ETL and data warehouses and all of that. But we're going to assume that knowledge that you know what you've come here to learn, right? You don't go to a Cisco class going, what's Cisco, right? So with that in mind, with this being a ground zero class, I have to show you what BIDS is. So BIDS is BI Dev Studio, right? And you can get to it by going start programs somewhere, Microsoft, anybody see Microsoft? There it is, SQL Server and Microsoft BI Studio, right? Doesn't really matter if you've got Visual Studio on there as well. Come to work on the microphone. Oh, okay. So just There's a mic down there? Yep, ignore me. <coughs> um, if you've got Visual Studio on there as well, you can easily go to Visual Studio. Uh, it doesn't matter. Are we there? Are we there? Ah, we're there. Are people actually having trouble hearing me? Look to the number on the back. Four. So you can adjust the volume here on the number four. Okay. Let's do that so just in case. Okay. How am I doing? Um, is this coming across any better? Yes. Really? Okay. I thought I projected very well. <coughs> so you can go into bids or you can go into Visual Studio. Either one, it'll get you to the same place. I've already got it open. But I've got so much stuff here, I can't seem to find. Hey, Sean? Yes? Wouldn't there used to be a problem that if you had Visual Studio 2005, and, but you try to go to, I mean, I'm sorry, SQL Server 2005, or 2008, sometimes you had a problem with this. Yes, absolutely. In that case, you would have to go to bids. You'd have to go to, you'd actually have to go to bids. Um, I will say that this class is going to concentrate solely on SQL 08. Every now and then when it's relevant and it crosses my mind, I may say, well, it used to be this way in 05. <clears throat> but I don't like to look back, darling. I, I never look back, right? So. you have the mic up a little bit? Wow. Well, how's that? Can you hear me now? I can hear better. I sound like a commercial. I'll crank the volume a little. How's that now? We'll get all these legit. Here, I'll just. It moves very slowly. 
main point was that you have <coughs> SQL Server 2008 and if you go to Vision Studio 2008, you're fine. Okay. Yes, okay. absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, okay. Uh, let's see. What else was I going to do? Okay. So, within here, all you have to do is start a new project. The type of project that you start is uh, fairly easy to figure out, right? You want an integration services project. We'll just call this our first project. Ooh, that was right. Will you stop with the make it better? And then we're waiting, we're waiting. Yeah, actually, I was, I was running late today because I actually had an SIS production package issue. I had to get sorted out. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay, so once we're in here, you notice that this is a, a little bit of a different environment than you're used to with Visual Studio, but a lot of the, same, a lot of the Visual Studio stuff still holds true, right? So you'll notice right off that we've got uh, four tabs across the top. We're going to concentrate on the first two tonight. <coughs> We're going to talk about control flow and data flow. Now, the big difference between control flow and data flow, it sounds easy, but people still manage to get themselves confused, right? And, it's, uh, and they call it something different, but oddly enough, Informatica is formatted the exact same way. They, they, they format control flow and data flow differently in different panes as well. Um, but control flow, I hate to say something stupid like it controls the flow of the package, but it's what controls precedence constraints and, and actually it's, it's your loops and your if-thens and your, and your cursors, right? And data flow is anything that causes data to move. And I realize that sounds easy, but it's not really easy unless you look at it the right way because a lot of people will look at the execute SQL task down here and say, well, I can call an SP, and in that SP, I can move data with an insert statement from one table to a next or from one server to a next. But you do that in the control flow, so how is it that that's not moving data, right? Um, it's not moving data because the data flow actually pulls the data into the SIS data flow engine, the, the execution engine, transforms it, does whatever it's gonna do, and then pushes it back out to a SQL server, okay? So that's the big difference. When you use an execute SQL task, and this is actually one of the big questions I get at work from my professional SIS developers, is, uh, is how is it that this isn't inside the data flow, the, the SQL task, because I, they do a lot of stuff inside the SQL task. And so I have to explain to them that when you do that, it, when you call an SP or when you call uh, just a, a regular insert statement from a SQL task, it stays inside of SQL like it does if you're running it through Management Studio or if you're just scheduling it as a job, right? But in the data flow, and you'll see that it's built differently, and these tasks over here actually change when you go to the data flow, and then you'll see that it actually loads it up into the SIS engine the SIS itself scrubs it and then sends it back out to wherever you want. Because you may not be sending it back to SQL. You may be sending it to, to flat files or to FTP or to XML or to, to DB2 or to Oracle or to a mainframe somewhere, right? So SIS doesn't care, okay? So that's, that's how I differentiate those two. Right now, we're actually going to start off with a data flow. Um, so we're just going to jump right in here and, and start moving data, right? There's no reason not to. So uh, you notice there are no data flows here, so I've got to grab a data flow and drag it across. Now this can be very misleading, right? It's like the old days of DTS when you open up the package and there's just one little element sitting in there and you're like, ah, this is going to be easy. And you double click on it and there's 6,000 lines of VB script code in there and you're like, oh, my day just got so long, right? You laughed at that. You get a, sir, up front, up front. <laughs> you laughed at my joke. You get a, you get a free ebook. <laughs> So, absolutely. No, no, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, um, it, it's kind of like that. Inside this data flow, once I go in there, I can have a hundred different table, table moves in here going to a thousand different servers. So you can open up this package and say, wow, look at that. Ah, this is going to be easy. 
and you double click on it and go, oh man, and have six pages of different data transform. Yes? <coughs> Uh, what do you mean by data flow environment? Okay, so click on data flow tasks. Oh, I understand the question. Okay, so the question is, if I've got two data flows here, um, will, they, will they both be controlled by this tab? The answer is yes, because you choose the data flow that you want here. So if I, if I double click on this one, it'll automatically open up that one on the data flow that I want. Same thing here, it'll automatically open it up on data flow one. But if I'm going through and doing things cyclically, then I can just change it here. Right? <coughs> okay, so we're going to get into rule, and, and I'm going to leave this here for now. I wasn't going to get this far ahead, but I'm going to leave that there now to remind me to talk about something. Okay? Um, rule number one, and we're going we're to come up with some rules here as we go through here, right? Rule number one, always name your tasks, right? Always name your containers. Always name everything. So I've got the data flow task here. Um, I happen to know that uh, it's going to be the table that we're doing. So I like to name these after the table I'm working with. So once I double click in here, I've got choices I can make. Uh, we're going to go from SQL to SQL right now, okay? I'm going to have to stay on the same box because clearly I've only got a laptop, so it's going to be same box to same box, right? But all you got to do is change the box and you'll be fine, right? So I'm going to do OLEDB data source because I'm going from SQL to SQL. We're doing the easiest thing you can do in SIS, and that's transferring data from one SQL database to another SQL database. So I guess I should say from one SQL table to another SQL table, right? Why is that the easiest? Why isn't a flat file the easiest? Well, anybody that's worked with flat files knows why that's not the easiest, right? Both of you. You? No, no, you, you. Black hair, yeah. I saw you both smiling at that. Here you go. Yeah, there you go. So, um, so flat files are coming, but they are not easy. In fact, we could dedicate and may dedicate. Yeah, that's fine. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Your decision. How's that? <coughs> so, yeah, don't make me the bad guy. So we may actually dedicate an entire class to flat files because it's a big topic. Um, it really is, and it's not easy. So, okay, so I've got my, my uh, OLEDB source. Now I need to choose a destination. Down here this time, I'm going to choose an OLEDB destination. And I realize that a lot of the performance tuning guys <coughs> will tell you to choose a SQL Server destination down here because there are some optimizations that you can get by doing that. But it's got a huge it's got a huge drawback. What is that huge drawback? Anybody? That's right. The package has to be running on the same server that the on the on the local server that the SQL destination is set for. Why would you not want your package to run on the same server? Well, okay. The question was why wouldn't you want the package running off the same server? Right? Well, what if, I mean, it's got to run on some server, right? Okay, so if you're taking it from box A to box B, it can't run from both boxes. So one of them has to be the destination, right? So maybe the destination box is a box that you've got very limited rights to. Maybe it's one, maybe it's a package that you control and, and that you wrote and that your department is in control of. So it's like a warehouse push to a data mart, to a regional data mart. And so you want the warehouse box to control the push because the warehouse has to get loaded before you can load your data marts, right? So maybe you want that to be the last package called in your data warehouse load. So you would obviously call that from your warehouse box. There are a number of reasons why. Maybe, uh, maybe, it, yes? Uh, the company I, I worked for had all of their uh, SSIS packages on one server and all the data they moved from a different server to yet a different Yeah, server. that's a very common scenario that I disagree with, by the way. 
Um, but what he said was in his company that in his company they've got dedicated SIS servers that only run packages, so it will never be on the source or the destination box, right? So there are, there are plenty of reasons why it wouldn't, okay? Um, another reason why it wouldn't, and this is one of the reasons why I chose OLEDB instead of SQL Server, is quite often the destination will move, or the package will have to move. Maybe, maybe the package gets too big for the server, and you have to move it to a different server, right? So now, you've got to change the type of destination you're using. And if you're using that all over your package and you've got 70 tables to load, you just made yourself a pretty big project. The difference between changing a server name in a config file and going through here and changing all of your, all of your destination types. So the best, what I'm hearing is the best thing to do is stick with the OLED data source. <coughs> and I'm going to say, okay, it's more that the OLEDB data source is more versatile and it may not be as fast in all situations as the SQL data source, but you can get around that most of the time. And unless you're absolutely positive that that package is on the destination server and will never, ever be moved, whether the package will never be moved or the database will never be moved, because how many people have been in a company where you've never moved a database to a different server because it got too big or it got too powerful or it got moved to a different group or the focus of it changed or something, 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 right? We move databases on different servers all the time, right? And I'm constantly having to change config files and SIS packages to point to that new server, constantly. Even if it's for a DR site, right? That's a perfect scenario. You've got a table in here, you've got a, a package in here that loads 70 tables and uh, your main box goes down and you fail over to the DR site. Now, for the next two days while you're getting your production box back up, you've got to run this off of the DR site and you, because you chose the SQL Server destination, you have to go in here and change all 70 of those and then you have to change them back. Well, hopefully you're smart enough to, you know, create a new package name and then just go back to the old package name, but you know. <laughs> so. Does that, does that cover it a little bit better? Um, anybody else on, on destinations? No? Okay. So we're going to come in here, and we've got to create a connection manager. And I'll show you this. I'm just going to create it, and I'll show you in a second. Gonna, oh, look at that. I've already got it. Yay. So I'm going to say SIS class. And I've got to pick a table. Now, I'm going to show you something, and then I'm going to show you something else. <laughs> I love that. Isn't that great? I'm fabulous. So I pick the table or view. This is an actual table. You go in here, you, pick, you can pick the columns. Tell it OK. And I've got it good, right? Now, I'm actually going to say, because I like to name my things, right? And I'll actually even do this. I'll call it source. So down here, I've got localhost SSIS class. Well, I actually prefer to name my data sources source, and we'll call it the name of the database. The name of the database. If I could spell SSIS. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, God, there are so many things to get into. I hope we. I hope we still have time. Where's Sri? Is he in here? Does anybody know what time I have to shut up? Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Seven twenty. Excellent. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so we're going to start a series of rules here, okay? A checklist, if you will, of things you want to go down every time, you, every time you do something like this, okay? The first rule, did I name my data source something appropriate? Something that's going to be easy for me to go back and change, right? I just got finished converting a package at work <coughs> that moved, you know, several dozen tables. And the, uh, uh, the connection managers down here said something like nightly and, um, you know, prod and dev. And I'm like, prod and dev, eh, right? But nightly? What the hell is nightly? Right? So that tells me absolutely nothing about where my data is going. So at least this tells me that it's a source database, right? That it's, that it's, a, that it's a source connection. Um, so what, what good does it do to specify that it's a source? Well, again, if it moves, if your package moves, then you know what all the source and destinations are. 
right? So if the destinations move, you can come in here and go, oh, well, this is a destination. That one's, that's one that needs to change. That's a destination. That needs to change. The source database is the same, so I don't need to touch any of the sources, so on and so on, right? So, so name your things appropriately. Down here, it's the same thing. I go new. Pick my table. Pick my mappings. And I'm assuming that everybody's seen something similar to this before, right? I'll have to actually hold your hand and tell you what the mapping screen is for. You know, taking one column to the next, right? <coughs> okay. So right now, we've got data that will move. But there are a few things I didn't do, and we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about these. Let me go ahead and go. So this is going from the same server to the same server. And as a matter of fact, these are both, well, no, these are in different databases, but they're the same server to the same server. So why did I choose different connection managers even if they're on the same server? I'm sorry? Exactly. You get a book. He said it. In case one day they're not on the same server. So, rule number one, name things appropriately. Rule number two, even if they're on the same box, use different connection managers for your source and destination. You will be very, very sorry if you don't. Okay? Ask me how I know. <coughs> not because I've done it. But because my developers do it, and I have to transfer their and I have to I have to transfer their packages all the time. So yeah, I know, right? <laughs> you get a book for sarcasm. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna we're gonna move this data now, right? Let me save this, and I'm gonna hit go. Yes. Yes. Trying to close all these windows. I can't hear you. Well, we we created the data flow in here, right? right. So uh, the data flow is the only one that has any work to do right now. Right. So the control flow knows that automatically. So you can see the data is moving, right? I think I got around six million rows in here. So you can see the data is moving, right? So it's the only thing in the control flow, so it's going to go with what it's got. No, the okay. I, I think I think the question you're asking is if I wanted to flip two columns in my data flow. If I wanted to switch two columns between the source and the destination, no, the the engine would take care of that as it's transferring the data. It would just map them to different locations. It has nothing to do with the control flow. The control flow is the control flow of the package, not the control flow of the data move, not where the data is going. And, and you'll see what I mean, okay? We're going to get into a little bit of that today, but you'll see what I mean. I'm sorry? When you name the source of the table, you go back over to the control flow, it's, it's still sitting that P table and data flow that you want. Right, right. See, now I told you that I told you control flow and data flow weren't as easy as they looked, right? So yeah, so this is the data flow itself. This is the container that holds those data moves. Okay? Right. Inside this container we have these elements that we're moving a table. Right? Do you understand the difference? Yeah, so it's like it's the flow task is really the control flow that you select. This is the data flow task for the control flow that you select. I'm not sure you're wording that right, but I think you got the idea. It's kind of like if this were a stored procedure yeah. and you change a variable inside the stored procedure, that doesn't change the name of the SP. Right? It's that's analogous to that. Am I explaining that right? 
Any, everybody who knows SIS? Tim, Mr. Studley? Does that sound good to you? Okay so, okay, so let's take a look at how long this took. We go over here to our execution tab. It took about 53 seconds, right? Now we're going to come to our next really big rule, and that rule is never choose table or view as your access mode, right? Never choose table or view as your access mode. Why? Why, he says. <laughs> now what I want to do, and I'll get, I'll get to why in a second. Uh, let me make sure I'm still on, somewhat on task here. Um, I'm sorry? Right, yeah, exactly. Right, well, fast load, and when we get to that, right? But fast load um, actually kicks it into bulk logged and does it as a, as a minimally logged bulk logged operation. Um, I'm not sure what it does in the background, but probably, yeah, probably. So for right now, we're going to use, even for simple ones, we are going to use the SQL command, okay? So we're going to say select star from dbo dot d table. <coughs> um, I'm going to pick our columns again. Now, to select star or to not select star, right? It really depends on what you're doing. If, uh, if the table is part of a vendor package or part of a well-established schema in your enterprise and it's almost never going to change, then by all means do select star, right? If it's not and you add columns to it continually or at least on a fairly regular basis, there are two schools of thought of that, aren't there? Um, use select star so you can automatically pick up the changes and don't use select star so that you can control the data that comes across. Um, at least this way it won't break the package if you don't use select star, right? At least it won't break the package. In a case like that, I mean in here I'm going to go ahead and use select star because I don't want to type out all those columns in front of you guys. <coughs> but if you've got a database that's going to be updated like that, then yes, by all means don't use select star because you don't want your your package to break because it's it's got new data that it wasn't expecting right so choose the column names wisely um, there are going to be some uh, there are going to be some more uh, things on our list and, I'll, and I actually printed out a, I actually printed up a list I'll show you here in a, in a few minutes um, so now let's run this one let me save that and let's run this one and what was it six million okay let me see where I am. In the source. Mm-hmm. <coughs> I'm sorry? Okay. Yeah, we're actually, well, this is a good time to talk about that, isn't it? Because when you use table or view, the adapter, the OLEDB adapter task in here uh, calls open ROSET during the validation phase and during one of the other phases too, I can't remember right now, which adds overhead. And it actually provides quite a bit. I mean, if, if you look in some of the Microsoft documentation and elsewhere, it, it will tell you that you can get pretty significant performance increases by going from using the open row set in the adapter to using the straight query. So it doesn't have that extra overhead of having to go call open row set twice and, and validate all the metadata. It just passes the query straight along through OLEDB. And let's see if we were actually any faster. 48. So from 48 to 53 just on this little table on the local thing, right? So that can get, that can get a lot more significant the more data you put in there, right? and the wider your table is. So that's our um, something with rule, right? Our third rule is always use a SQL query when you're pulling this stuff, right? Um, let's see. Let's go ahead. Oh, stop that. 
<coughs> Good, so now we've got this. Now we can, if we had another table to, uh, to transfer, we could put them both here in the same data flow task, right? Very easily, I could stack these up. I can, I can very easily copy and paste entire things. God, don't you love that? So I can paste the entire thing. I've got, I've got an exact copy of that over there. So if I needed to, to copy two tables that were very similar, all I have to do in, is come in here and now and just make some simple changes and then I'm, I'm good, right? So do I want to do these in the same data flow task or do I want to separate them into separate data flow tasks? Does any, anybody here have any opinions on that? Mm -mm. Okay, assuming this package is going to transfer two tables, do I want to do them in the same data flow task or do I want to split them up into two separate data flow tasks? I see. I'm sorry? Oh, no, that has nothing, no, that has nothing to do. You can still get parallel processing from, from different data flows. I'm sorry? Error handling. No. Sequential. What do you mean? Assuming they, assuming they can both be processed at the same time. Assuming they can both be run at the same time. They're completely disparate. It might depend. It might. <coughs> nope. Because I can use the same connection manager from different data flows. Okay, so now... <coughs> It's too, it's too easy to get around that. Good idea, but that's too easy to get around that. Okay, so I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is you want them to go into separate data flows. Okay? And the reason is, is because of this, little, this nice little guy right here that we call a sequence container. I love these guys. Anybody that did uh, DTS 2000 loves sequence containers because so, it, it was so hard to sequence things in, in DTS, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to drop this inside the sequence container. I'm going to put another sequence container right here. I'm going to do that. So I've got these in separate sequence containers. <coughs> and what this is going to do is the sequence container does just what it sounds like, right? It controls the sequence of the package. Right now we're getting back around to whoever it was that had the question about, uh, about workflow, about the control flow. Now you can see because if I can get this, got the, the, uh, so I can control these to go one after another, right? So this one will go first, then this one will go, or I can control them to go both at the same time. But what difference does it make? Did I not put that in there? I thought I did. They don't have to be in sequence containers. No, they don't. But we're talking about, we're talking about, whole package support, right? Remember what I told you? I'm not just going to teach you, um, I'm not just going to teach you the functionality. I'm going to teach you how to actually build packages properly. <coughs> Why on earth would I need to put these in sequence containers? What about pre and post processing for these tables? What if you have to truncate the tables first? What if you have to drop indexes? What if you have to reload indexes? What if you just have to recreate indexes? What if you have to drop this or drop that, right? All of those things would go in the same sequence container as its table. Otherwise, you have to do all of that stuff in a single sequence container for all the tables inside the data flow and then run the data flow with all the tables in it. Does that make sense? Let's diagram this out just a little bit because I, I see a couple blank looks. Um, here's what this is going to look like. I'm going to say execute SQL, execute SQL. And let's say, and now you're going to learn the execute SQL task too, right? So I drag that arrow down to there, so that's going to happen first. Now this is going to happen. Okay, so I've got an execute SQL task in front of each one of them. 
let's call it truncate table and I'll say the the data source type is direct input we'll we'll talk about these more later and we'll just say truncate table the table probably wouldn't hurt too bad if I picked a connection right another way where this comes in really handy I want to pick the destination don't I I don't want to I don't want to truncate the source go ahead ask me how I know so we'll do the same thing over here and again I want to do this I want to do the destination uh, let's say and again I want to do the source so you can see here that I've got a simple control flow where I'm going to uh, where I'm going to truncate each one of these tables before I here let me just make that smaller how's that before I load it because it's going to be a full load right well what if I'm having problems with one of the tables in production and I need to open up the package and see what's going on and run it by hand right well I can just run this entire container and take care of that one table instead of having to pick out the code that truncated all of the tables together and then try to find a way to because uh, I can't really disable these guys right inside of here I can't disable that there's nothing to disable so I have to delete it so if I've got 10 tables in here and only one of them failed I've got to run all 10 tables again instead of just the one table right but if they're in their own data flow and there's only one of them in there well then I can I can truncate the table uh, drop the indexes load the table rebuild the indexes all by coming here and saying execute container and I can leave the rest of them alone so this is a full support path that we're looking at here not just I'm going to design something and not have anything else in mind and then pigeonhole myself in and pigeon my, pigeonhole myself in the arse when it comes time to support this thing right so always use sequence containers even for a single table because your requirements may change right now it may just be a simple load but if you run this on a continual basis you may have requirements of pre-processing and post-processing on these tables and you've already got the structure built in right I don't have to touch the rest of this package if I want to add something to this sequence I just add something to the sequence if it's a if it's an FTP something or a file or a flat file something or whatever you were first The, I mean, when you start if there are no arrows in here, if they're all at the same level and there are no arrows, there are no precedence arrows, they'll all start simultaneously just as they would have if they were in, in control flows. I mean, if they were all in the same data flow. There's no difference whatsoever. And if you need to, you can pick one individually and run it without the others. Mm -hmm. okay. Absolutely. Yes? In the back? Yeah, yeah. The his comment was that you could use any of these the the for each or the for loop, the for each or the sequence. And you're right, <clears throat> but I think we can agree that the top two containers are a little bit more specialized, right? So this is actually for sequencing. So if I wanted one of these to run before the other one, then I would just drag an arrow over here and it would run before the other one. I would I would typically put one of these below the other one so I like the top level ones running on top and the other but the screen is so small and the the font is so big on this presentation I have a hard time getting it down there right um, I suppose I could do that and change the zoom or I could say take me to 50 percent and then I could come here and arrange these guys a little bit better so this is how I'd actually want that to look right so we're going to use sequence containers for everything and I'm going to go back here to 100 percent now this arrow right here this is a precedence arrow right if I right click on it right now it says on success but I could also say on on failure or on completion <coughs> so the way I've got it set up right now I only want the second table to to go if the first table ran right somebody said earlier um, uh, for uh, the the when I was asking this question somebody's answer earlier was in order to handle primary and foreign keys 
Well, this way you could, you could load the primary key table first and then the, the foreign key table, and if the primary key table aired out, you sure as hell don't want to do the foreign key table, right? Because you're just begging for trouble, right? You know it's going to error then. It's only going to take longer now. So, and of course, then you can do it on failure. So you can have failure actions as well. So we're, we're, we're very well going to talk about that, right? So I'm going to go ahead and pull up the list now. Another question? I saw him. Well, um, very easy. Uh, one of them, the green one on success, will only go to the next sequence if this top one completes without any errors. Okay? On completion, says I don't care if it finishes or not. I, mean, I don't care if it finishes successfully or not. Once it finishes, even if there's an error, go to the next one. So, on completion, right? It may not be dependent on the other data, but you wanted to, and, and in a case like that, you may do something like that because the data is not dependent on each other. You want the rest of the package to go ahead and finish, but maybe you're, maybe you're controlling the flow like that because for resource constraints on the box. So maybe you only want one of them running at a time, but you really don't care if the other one finishes or if the other one completes successfully before you go to the next one. You'll handle, you'll handle that after the package is done. You'll go back and run that one sequence again. You see? Ah, good question. Depends on how you set up your error handling in the package, right? Can you share the good question? Ah, she asked, uh, she asked if it would show, if, if in a case like this, if this one failed and went on to the next one, she asked if it would show, the, uh, show that as a package failure. And it depends on how you handle your errors. You can tell it to not fail the package. You can tell it to fail the package. You can tell it to just silently continue. And in which case, if you tell it to silent continue, you'll probably take one of those red arrows off of there and handle the error yourself, right? So I'm kind of like that. I don't like packages failing, right? Even if they fail, I don't like opening up the job window and seeing red, red X's in my job window. I prefer to get an alert email that tells me that one of the data flows in the package failed, right? Um, and handle it that way. But I don't, that, that's particularly, we've got a, a data center, we've got a, a knock that handles all of our alerts and I don't like getting them involved in anything so I prefer getting and so if, if something fails through my jobs it'll send up something through NetIQ which will get those lesser skilled techs involved and uh, that's, nev that's never good for me at 3 a.m. so I prefer to get an email that says hey this thing did and I'll go deal with it myself. You've been laughing at my jokes an awful lot. You want a transcender thing? <laughs> <laughs> no? Okay. Yeah, I prefer to control my own emails in my packages or in my jobs myself and just not fail the package or the job. What was the question, Sean? It was very hard to hear, but it was the basically how do I prefer to do it, let the knock handle it. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Whether, whether I prefer to let the knock handle it or whether I prefer to handle it myself. So this is something that we didn't cover yet. Which one of these is? I think I've only got one. Of, it was in the second one, wasn't it? Ah, okay. So you see here, I can switch to the first one. Ha ha. This is a very big one with me. Um, actually, sorry, not here. It is actually down here. <coughs> it is a rule. Yes, it is. This is a supportability rule that I'll bet you anything the master Tim back there doesn't do. <laughs> and I've learned this through years of trying to support both DTS and SIS packages. And I'm telling you, I will come to your job and cut you off the kneecaps myself if I catch you not doing this in production. You go to the All tab. And over here where it says Application Name, you change this to something useful so that if it causes problems, you know exactly where to go or your support people know exactly where to go. Okay? 
So here's something that I like to do. Um, I'll put something like uh, localhost dot, uh, what did I call this package? We'll call it class one dot, what's the name of the, what's the name of the data flow? The table, and then I'll put colon insert. So I can just see at the end of it what it's, what it's doing, right? And so where does this come in handy? This comes in handy when your uh, thing is off the screen and you can't see it. Come on, dude, work with me. I think I can still barely hit that button. All right. So that comes in handy when I'm doing something like this. <coughs> so let's say I've got a, a production problem. <coughs> Somebody says something's blocking something or something's taking too much time, something or other, right? <coughs> As a DBA, what's the first thing you do? Select from sys processes, right? So as I come in here and run this guy now, well, let's get this guy back into a runnable state. Let's kill that. And the rest of that is fine. So we'll come here. I'll run that. I can double click on that. I see I'm moving data. And as I come here and do my sys processes, I probably should have trimmed that down a little bit, huh? Uh, let's find not the SID program name. So I can see here my threads. I've got localhost. I can see the server I need to go to. I can see the package I need to go to, the data flow, and I can tell what it's doing. Right away, I already have tons more information than I had before from a support standpoint, right? So automatically I go, wow, oh, it's updating and it's blocking something. Gee, I wonder what I need to do in my query to make that perform better, right? Or if you even want to break it down even more and do a, a four-part name, you put, you can put uh, uh, server, job name, package name, so on and so on and so on, right? So if you know the job name, what the job name is going to be, then add that to it as well, right? Makes support a lot easier for your folks when they can say, I'm having a problem with this guy right here instead of, oh, well, it's, it's package GUID coming from job GUID from some server I have no idea, right? So that is definitely a rule. And I will show you that again. You come into your connection manager, you go to all, and that is under application name. Yes, you do. Because they may change, right? Um, yeah, you're right. <coughs> yeah, he asked if, uh, um, he, he said he guarantees I'm not doing it this way in my job because I'm probably doing it more dynamically and loading these dynamically. And he's right, right? Um, you do stuff like this dynamically when you can. Um, I do this in my job, and I'll be honest, quite a few of them are hard-coded because we've had the same packages on the same servers for like five years, and they've never moved. Um, and it was more important to me to get this in place, right? But absolutely, if, if that's a requirement, then do things as dynamically as you can. Yes? Tom, you change that packet size from 0 to 32, 76, and 70, it's the equivalent of changing the size of a right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. He said, he said changing the packet size uh, helps as well, and he's absolutely right. Um, a lot of the optimizations come around changing the packet size and changing the batch size, right, which we'll clearly get into as we go through, right? But yes, absolutely. Good point. So let me go ahead and pull out my list. Let me see if I know there's some stuff I've forgotten. I know there is some stuff I have forgotten. I think I said that. No, both of these tables are both flat because we're going as, as simple as simple can be. Here. Okay, so this is your minimal data flow checklist, right? And I'll be happy to send, send this out to everybody or I'll post it up with the, 
with the class notes or whatever. So whenever you do something like this, whenever you create a flow, you want to go through these steps. Ask yourself these questions. Am I using the right source and destination adapters? Which means, am I using a SQL destination or an OLADB destination? Whichever one's appropriate for me, right? Am I using a SQL query instead of the adapter? That is almost always going to be the case, right? Um, am I only pulling the columns I'm needed? I, I need. This is a really, really big one. For those of you that don't believe me that there's a difference between pulling four columns and pulling 150, right? Um, there's a huge difference. And I see that so much. I, I started telling my developers, pull with a SQL query. Pull with a SQL query, pull with a SQL query. So of course, we've got stuff coming in from Oracle. And this is the, the last example we did just a couple weeks ago. Um, they started pulling stuff from Oracle. They need like seven columns out of an Oracle table, and they pulled like 270 because they just did a select star and then just went on about their business. I have nothing else to say about that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> did I set the application name for both adapters? Right? That's a big one. Am I writing, am I pulling or writing the different data flows in parallel? You will get a huge benefit, <coughs> and I'm going to put this in, in parentheses, if you have the resources, right, you will get a huge benefit if you have the resources for, run, for loading your tables in parallel. Don't just run one after another, after another, after another, after another, after another. Guys, load five tables at a time if you can. It'll go so much faster, right? Um, uh, is my source table indexed for the query I'm using? That's not really an SIS thing, is it? But you'd be amazed at how many people I get that write these, these really decent joins in their source adapter and say, it's taking 45 minutes to pull. I don't understand. And I look at it, and it's doing nothing but table scans, and you add a couple indexes, and boom, it runs in a few seconds. Oh, you're amazing. OK, sure. Um, <coughs> are the tables in the different flows on different file groups or on different disks, if possible? And again, this isn't a a specific SIS thing, but again, remember, we're going to go through this stuff, uh, we're, we're going to hit the performance stuff as we're going through, right? So, you know, if you're, if you're loading things in parallel and you're loading them to the same IDE disk on your laptop in a demo, it's not going to perform very well, right? Same thing on your server. If you've got a database that's all on the same RAID 5 with, say, 10 spindles and you say, I'm going to increase my performance and I'm going to and I'm going to load five tables at a time, well, you're, you're just dealing with disk contention now, right? <coughs> so you, in that case, you'd be better off loading one or two at a time, right, and taking, and taking a more sequential path. But if you've got the tables on separate data flows, and that's one thing, if you can, if you've got file groups set up in your database on different arrays or on different spindles, um, set the ones on different spindles to run at the same time. Right? Don't run all the ones on the same spindle, then all the ones at the other spindle, and all the ones on the other spindle. <laughs> like, what? So consider that when you're building your package. Consider the, the physical layout of your database on, and, and take that into consideration when you do your precedence for your packages. Um, where was I? Uh, if I can't remove the indexes, uh, what fill factor am I using? So that's a really good one. A lot, of, a lot of places, they don't, you know, it's impractical to remove the indexes. You've got 700 million rows, a billion and a half rows. You're not going to be removing that index, right? <coughs> but is the fill factor such that it can support my data load without fragmenting it to 90% every single night, right? So you have to work with your DBAs on that. Um, do I have my data and log split? Again, that comes to physical database layout, but it's, uh, it's a huge thing that people never consider. And these are things I want you to, to ask yourself every time you go to build a package, because it changes, right? I change my, my database layouts all the time. And so a guy could write a package with one set of information, go to, come to me the next week, and it'll be complete diff completely different, because maybe we got a new drive in, maybe we filled up a drive, and I decided to move something else over there, and you didn't know what it's all about. So verify. Right? And if you do move something, if you do have a package set up a certain way and they reorganize the physical structure of the database, well, then you have to revisit your package. Don't just set it and forget it, right? Yes? Question number nine, you're saying are, are the, the data files and the log files separate on separate disks? 
Yes. Yes. The question was, uh, do I mean that I want the data and log files on different disks? The answer is yes. Um, do I have tab lock enabled? Somebody mentioned tab lock a few minutes ago, and absolutely you want tab lock enabled because it, you know, clearly you only have one lock to hold. Few, fewer locks, less expensive, faster load, right? Um, do I have each data flow on a sequence container? God, I love this one. Yes? <coughs> well, because I have a couple packages like that, and if you've ever tried to do something like that, now there are a couple ways that can be done. The question was why not have all of each individual table in a separate package? It's a fair question. Now, I've seen it like that, and I've seen other people recommend that. If you do that, you have to call the package. You're, you're, you're not going to get around the, the constraint problem, right? So inside SIS, and this is getting above some of you, but I'm talking directly to him. Um, inside your package, you're still going to have to have your constraints, right? You're still going to have to have precedence. So you're going to have to call an external package for each one of those, right? So that's going to perform more poorly because that's another package you've got to load into memory every time. So in between, you've got to load that package into memory, and then you've got to kill then you got to load another package into memory, then you've got to load another package into memory, right? And you've still got to use precedence constraints because what are you going to do? Put 80 packages in a job? You don't work in my shop, right? We've already got people that do that, okay? You understand what I mean? Right. Right. And so the the statement was if you have a package failure, then it's easier if you've got every single table in an individual in, in its own individual package, it's easier to go through and run that individual package again and troubleshoot that one package if 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 it fails, so you don't have to go through and disable things or you don't have to right click and open up the design. And I agree. Um, it really depends on your environment, right? If you've got that volatile of a package, if you've got that volatile uh, uh, of, a, of a data load, then maybe you do need to go that route, right? And it depends on what's causing the package failure too, right? Um, if it's something you have to open the package for, or if you just have to rerun the package, if it happens every now and then, the network drops the connection and kills your load, and all you have to do is restart it, sure, right? But then again, you can also get that exact same thing by doing what in SIS? Checkpoints, right? So you can get the same effect by doing checkpoints, right? They are a little flaky, yes. I don't use them myself. But what I like to do typically is I like to is I like to split the difference, right? I like to find a natural progression. And we're going to talk about this in a couple months in this class. He's he's getting a little ahead of me, but that's fine. Is I like to find uh, a a midpoint, right? If I've got something like 80 tables to load, I'll pick a good midpoint and put five or ten packages in this one, five or ten packages in the or tables, you know, five or ten tables here, five or ten tables there, and then I'll control the package flow that way, right? So that I've got chunks of tables that make sense. So if I'm if I'm loading everything from this server to this server and then casting it out, well I'll put all these guys in one package and then put the cast in a different package. Right? Something like that. So these are design things that we're definitely going to talk about. One more question. Yeah, um, we'll talk about that after class. Be, be sure to come up to me because I want everybody to hear that, but unfortunately we're extremely out of time. Do I have 60 seconds to answer that question? Okay. <clears throat> the reason is because I'm, I'm supporting a package like that now, and it's got no fewer than 87 packages listed in there. Okay? Support that. <laughs> right? It's, it's ridiculous to support. Well, like I said, if, you're, if you want to put them in separate packages, the way to do that is to then call those separate packages from a master package and then have that master package called from the, the job instead of having 87 or 90 steps in the job. Because supporting that is a nightmare. What happens if, what happens if in your job 
uh, you want to change, somebody comes up with a different regulatory thing, or you have to start, you have to start, um, uh, what am I trying to say, guys? You, you want to start handling the errors, the alerts, the alerts, that's what I'm trying to say. You want to start handling the alerts differently, right? You've got 87 changes to make. Okay, I've got one. What's the frame and price? I'm sorry? What's the subpackage frame and price such that basically calling the same package different frame? Oh, I see. Yeah, well, you know, I would handle that in, a, in the same package as well. But yeah, you can see by the questions that we're getting here that there are a lot of variables, right? And I can't teach you every single variable, nor can I dictate what everybody does in their, in their environment, right? What I want to do is introduce the questions to you, introduce the factors to you so that you can make an educated decision on what to do in your environment. And if you choose that something in your environment is done exactly the opposite of something I recommend, that's your environment. I mean, you've, you've weighed those decisions and you've made a decision. And that's perfectly okay. The thing that's not okay is to make a decision because you didn't even know this other thing existed, right? So if you don't agree with everything I say, hey, more power to you. If you, if you agree with everything I say but you can't do something for one reason or just refuse it, hey, more power to you, right? But my job here is to give you the tools and the knowledge to be able to think of the different variables you need to think of, right? And that concludes this class. I didn't get half of the, the demos done that I wanted to, but this was excellent. <laughs>